My name is Anthony, and with me is Chris, and we're senior engineers in the HashiCorp Infrastructure Platform Organization. And today we're going to be sharing a little bit about our journey of adopting Temporal at HashiCorp by explaining how we got started with Temporal and what things look like today. We'll also provide an overview of four of the notable challenges that we had during our journey and um, discuss some of the specifics of how we solved them. Despite some of the challenges we'll mention, I do kind of want to preface this by saying our journey has been spectacularly painless for adopting a new technology to us. Um, thanks to this entire community, um, the lessons that were shared at last year's replay. So um, if our talk seems like it's actually three talks in a trench coat masquerading as one talk, it's because we just really wanted to give as much as we could about um, the lessons that we've learned. Uh, in particular, also, we'd really like to give a shout out to Jacob uh, for last year's talk, Temporal at Datadog. Uh, it was a huge influence on our design decisions, uh, and it definitely helped us avoid some of our, uh, what would have probably been early stumbling blocks. So thanks, Jacob. And finally, we'll uh, kind of close by just giving you an end-to-end -end example of like everything put together that hopefully will help tie it all together. So with that agenda, let's dive right in. The first part of our story is a story about Terraform Cloud. Uh, it's a story about Blast Radius, um, how it impacted us as an infrastructure organization, and how we dealt with it by embracing cellular architecture. And we'll explain how Temporal was instrumental in um, enabling this architectural change. Uh, and then we'll discuss how we use Temporal today. Since the beginning, uh, we've run most of Terraform Cloud on, well, everything except for the asynchronous bits like um, Terraform runs, on Nomad using one big cluster per environment. We manage the provisioning and configuration of these Nomad clusters using Terraform and use the custom CLI to safely roll the clusters during deployments. Uh, and after we released Terraform Cloud Agents two years ago, we decided to refactor our asynchronous bits to also use Terraform Cloud Agents and to run those on Nomad as well. While we were fairly confident we could scale up our existing Nomad clusters, uh, we took a different approach. We instead decided to run these agents on a second hardened cluster uh, that was designed specifically for what is essentially remote code execution as a service. And this worked great, actually, until it didn't. Um, and we soon found that the highly variable, bursty nature of customer workloads uh, on this second cluster posed some unique challenges um, for us uh, and impacted shared resources on the cluster. Testing, cool. So uh, yeah, at that point, um, we did what anyone would do, right? We split that second cluster into a bunch of smaller clusters and we utilized a form of cellular architecture known as shuffle sharding to schedule customer workloads across this pool of smaller clusters. Um, with shuffle sharding, what we do is we assign each customer a random but deterministic subset of clusters from the larger pool. And uh, kind of where the magic comes in is that the odds that any two customers share the exact same virtual shard assignment is exceedingly small. And that helps us uh, reduce the likelihood that any one customer would impact another. So to give a quick example, um, imagine a scenario with two customers, each with a virtual shard assignment of four independent Nomad clusters. And in this particular, oh, not yet. <laughs> in yeah, this every, particular example, um, the two virtual shards overlap by a single cluster. Now imagine that the second customer causes an issue that results in a cluster degradation or a complete outage. Um, this can be for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's malicious workloads. Sometimes it's pathological workloads that result in thundering herds or things like that. Um, in this situation, the second customer's workloads are going to be rescheduled onto the next available cluster in their shard, where the same issue is probably going to happen again. And as you can imagine, this pattern will continue until the second customer has exhausted all of the clusters in their virtual shard, resulting in a complete outage for that customer. Uh, kind of the awesomeness of shuffle sharding is that customer one is redirected to the next available cluster in their virtual shard, which was not impacted by this issue with customer two. And that uh, magic is what allows us to offer a single tenant-like experience on top of multi-tenant infrastructure. 
and it has helped us reduce uh, the blast radius for a large class of issues. And it ultimately has helped us sleep better at night as an infrastructure team. Um, on the other hand, it did kind of give us some new problems, which is like, how the heck do we manage all of these Nomad clusters? Um, as we continued to expand the number of clusters in our fleet, we found some gaps in our management tooling that, while used to be rare, started to become more and more common as we accelerated both the number of clusters in our fleet, as well as the frequency and number of deployments, cluster deployments. And so that forced us to rethink our approach to managing these clusters. Um, so we worked with our friends on the Nomad team, who were awesome, and they helped us kind of identify where the gaps were in our current process and helped us devise a new process for rolling clusters that largely mirrors the official product documentation for Nomad, but included some additional safety mechanisms for our particular use case. Um, and then we started looking for a tool or technology that could help meet the requirements of this new process. Um, we started with an early POC of Amazon Step Functions. Uh, we really liked the integration with AWS, but we found the DSL to be lacking in terms of its readability, testability, and maintainability. No offense to any AWS folks in the house. Um, next, we considered, I think the colloquial term is the workflow engine that shall not be named. Um, we do have a pretty large expertise with this other tool at HashiCorp. Um, but when we looked into it, we found that we would need to do some significant investment in order to repurpose the existing implementation of that tool for our use case. And so we took a step back and we kind of said, if we're gonna have to invest time and resources into running a solution like this ourselves, we would like to find an alternative that gave us a path to a managed offering in the future. And at the time, Temporal Cloud was still in beta, but we felt pretty confident that it provided a roadmap for us to migrate workloads in the future. Um, and so ultimately, we landed on Temporal. So our first foray into using Temporal was um, we started out with a single, nomad ser a single Temporal service for managing our growing fleet of Nomad clusters. And immediately we found it to be an exceedingly good fit for that use case. Uh, it really only took a couple of days to implement the first draft of the management policies as a temporal workflows, given the huge head start provided by the Go Samples SDK, uh, or the Go Samples repo, um, temporal light running locally, um, and lots of other great community resources. So we felt productive pretty quickly. Um, and we also had the mindset shift of we found translating our management policies into temporal workflows um, to be extremely natural. And so we, we also had some great early learnings. So for example, we, in our previous world, automation bugs would ultimately often just be totally unrecoverable. It's just, no, like, that's done, okay. Uh, but with Temporal, uh, we found that whenever we, like even if a workflow was stuck on some unexpected case or maybe just buggy logic that was totally our fault, um, usually we could just push a fix in real time. Like there would be some latency, you know, retries happening, but generally we could fix things in flight without losing any work. And when we kind of realized this, it felt like we had just gained a superpower because historically, it, it was very stressful to, to, to worry about automation failing, and now it's like, well, we'll get around to it. It's, it, it's fine. Uh, we also found that Temporal just gave us an entirely new set of tools for dealing with unexpected states, edge cases, um, things which just started to increase as we scaled up, um, and we felt that we now had the tools to kind of like identify these things and sort of just work them into the um, workflow logic so that ultimately we, we've just been gaining confidence in the automation that we run since then. As we continued to embrace cellular architecture, uh, we were also very cognizant, though, of the potentially large impact it could have on our internal customers. Um, it was important to us to not force engineering teams to have to reason about our growing and dynamically changing compute topology during their routine infrastructure interactions. So, and we also recognize that 
we would kind of lose all of the excellent resiliency properties of cellular architecture if we were just to change all cells simultaneously. So at this point, we realized, OK, we have a new workflow problem. Uh, and again, we, we turned to Temporal to um, help us build a compute API to allow our customers to manage their workloads across the many Nomad clusters in our growing fleet. So this was the first time that a Temporal service had been exposed to anyone outside of the infrastructure organization. And it ended up being a great opportunity for us to revisit some of the early decisions with Temporal for a new use case, which was essentially offering self-service infrastructure um, for our internal customers. And the implementation and uh, capability of that new use case ended up quickly exceeding our expectations. And from those first two temporal services, uh, we were soon joined by several others to form what is now pretty much the beginnings of uh, what has become our next generation infrastructure platform, which is powered by Temporal. OK, cool. So now um, I'd like to switch gears and get into the meat of our talk, which is kind of sharing some of the scars and lessons learned and the challenges that we faced on our journey from POC with Nomad all the way to building an internal infrastructure platform with Temporal. Um, in particular, we'll dig into how we simplify onboarding and adoption of Temporal by extending Temporal's official SDKs with our own internal SDK. We'll talk about how we avoid or reduce the opportunities for making mistakes with Temporal by embracing code generation with protocol buffers. We'll talk about how we provide granular authorization via policy-based access control for securing our Temporal APIs. And last but not least, we'll talk about how we stopped reinventing the wheel by embracing Terraform and reusable Temporal workflows and activities. Um, so kind of the very first challenge we ran into as Temporal was starting to grow organically was you know, how do we make it easy to onboard new teams and new, new services to Temporal? Um, I think in order to truly appreciate this challenge from our perspective, it's helpful if I share a little bit about what a production-ready Temporal service looks like at HashiCorp. Um, today, we run multiple Temporal clusters across several different logical environments and geographic regions. Uh, in order to provide high availability and disaster recovery capabilities to the services that depend on Temporal, we rely on global namespaces and multi-cluster replication to ensure that every service deployment's namespace is replicated to at least one primary and secondary zone in different geographic regions. We also leverage Vault's uh, PKI Secrets Engine to provide short-lived spiffy flavored TLS credentials that provide mutual authentication and encryption of the underlying TCP connections between temporal clusters, clients, and workers. And we rely heavily on Temporal's remote codec server integration to provide end-to-end -end encryption of activity and workflow payloads, because a lot of our workflows require highly sensitive and privileged credentials for interacting with production systems. And then last but not least, uh, we took Jacob's advice from last year and decided to just have services expose their APIs directly as temporal workflows, queries, signals, and updates. And we found this to be incredibly powerful in practice. So in order to ease the learning curve and reduce the risk of misconfigurations, uh, we decided to author an internal Go SDK that provides types, utilities, and methods that make it easy and secure to integrate with our globally distributed temporal architecture. It's used by both our clients and workers uh, for several important capabilities, um, you know, just kind of like basic initializing of temporal clients with all of the, the necessary configuration for credential management, header providers, context propagators, codec converters, client and worker interceptors for common auth and validation tasks. Uh, and then most importantly, it provides cluster discovery to locate the active cluster for a particular service namespace, and then handles automatic failover in the event of a cluster outage. Uh, it also provides some helpful utilities for authorization, uh, unit and integration testing, and workflow replay. And this has helped kind of simplify some of the more tedious parts of securing and testing temporal workflows. Uh, one thing I really do want to call out here, and I think this differs from what a lot of folks in the community have advocated for, is we, we deliberately chose not to hide or wrap the temporal SDKs. Uh, 
Um, and instead, we continue to make them available for our more uh, intermediate or advanced users. Um, but we do keep it out of the way as much as possible for those who are just getting their feet wet. So yes, we, we do want the temporal SDK to be available, but we found, and we were really inspired by the talks um, last year that advocated for code generation. Um, at HashiCorp, we love Go. And while Temporal does make things easier, uh, we found that working with the official Go SDK uh, was sometimes repetitive and sometimes left opportunities for developers to trip up. Some of these trip ups were trivial, like just forgetting to register a workflow or an activity before trying to call it, um, or not knowing the task queue name and having to figure it out. Um, but others would be like, problems that you may not notice until you get to production where they may be actually serious problems like having the wrong ID reuse policy or the wrong retry policy. Um, and that's not theoretical, actually. Um, probably the most embarrassing incident for our team uh, internally was caused by just a really tiny retry uh, interval, doing a, generating a lot of work. Um, <laughs> So, Whoops. yeah. It's like, I always do that, the, the, the wrong decimal place. Um, most of all, uh, we really miss static typing and all the benefits that come with that. No offense to anyone here who's not into that. Um, and so we, we believe there are enough foot guns here that uh, code generation could really pay off for us. So to address these shortcomings uh, and make it easier for us to onboard other people, um, both workflow authors and workflow consumers, we've implemented a fully open source ProTalk plugin that generates type temporal clients and workers in Go from protobuf schemas. And we're going to be showing you a little bit about how it works today. Uh, we chose protocol buffers for many reasons, uh, including the ability to leverage the Vibrant ecosystem, uh, our extensive use of them internally at HashiCorp, uh, the excellent tooling that we have built up around them, and uh, their existing support within Temporal, for example, the default data converter. Uh, we were also able to lean heavily on prior art in our initial iterations, thanks to, um, well, having stumbled upon, I don't even remember how we came across it, but having stumbled upon the very inspiring uh, Temporal SDK Go advanced project uh, that was created by Temporal Zone Chad Retz. I don't know if Chad's in the room, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Chad. <laughs> um, so our plugin allows workflow authors to configure sensible defaults. Uh, Guardrails simplifies the implementation and testing of temporal workers and streamlines integrations by providing type client SDKs uh, and even an optionally generated CLI interface. It works by having workflow authors annotate their proto service schemas with options for workflows, activities, queues, et cetera, et cetera, temporal primitives. Uh, and these annotations can include default timeouts, uh, default uh, workflow and update IDs, or ID patterns to generate workflow IDs, um, search attributes, policies for ID reuse, et cetera. Uh, in other words, many of the activity and workflow options that you may already be familiar with. We like this approach because we feel it keeps this, what is really critical logic, um, in the hands of the service author rather than leaving it up to the consumer to figure out what the right number to use is. So from the schema, the plugin generates statically typed helpers for implementing and registering temporal primitives from your workers. These helpers include friendly methods for executing activities and child workflows, handling signals, or signaling work workflows in flight. We found that this removes some of the boilerplate that uh, tends to be common with temporal code. And uh, ultimately, the effect is um, it makes your workflow, like the workflow code that's left uh, really describes like what the workflow is doing. And so it ultimately makes your workflow logic a lot easier to grok, having a lot of this boilerplate sort of uh, hidden. It also generates type client SDKs that can be used to interact with your temporal workers or dur durable executionists. Um, I, somebody's awake. Uh, 
These clients include methods for executing and fetching workflows or interacting with executions in flight, uh, executing queries, sending signals to running workflows. And last but not least, the plugin can optionally generate a typed command line interface for interacting with your temporal workers. Uh, it documents the CLI based on comments in your protobuf schema and generates uh, typed and validated CLI command line flag helpers, um, other helper methods for you know, integrating your CLI with other CLIs, et cetera. All right. Um, another challenge that we faced while building an internal infrastructure platform with Temporal was how to handle authorization for services that expose their APIs directly as Temporal workflows. Um, while MTLS provides authentication at the connection level, we really needed the ability to provide granular authorization within individual workflow executions. And we actually found that Temporal posed some kind of unique constraints in this area. Uh, so unlike you know, traditional HTTP or gRPC requests, temporal workflows are durable operations. They're often long-lived. They can be archived for even longer periods of time. They can be rescheduled across workers and even reset or replayed for testing or troubleshooting purposes. And unlike HTTP or gRPC request headers, uh, the metadata associated with workflows, which includes context propagation payloads, are passed as workflow headers and recorded in plain text in the workflow history. And also the fact that many of these workflows are long-lived requires that any authorization processes be deterministic to avoid non-determinism non errors if the workflow is reset, rescheduled, or replayed. And so we set out to find an authorization solution that kind of solved for Temporal's unique constraints but also something that we could implement in a familiar fashion for those of the engineers on our team that are more familiar with working with like traditional web-based authorization frameworks. And we found our solution in biscuits, which uh, is like one of my favorite breakfast foods. <laughs> but I think it's actually for the, like, the, the Euro biscuit, fancy cookies. Um, you don't eat cookies for breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, so for those unfamiliar with biscuits, um, they're an authorization token that was kind of designed to address many of the shortcomings uh, inherent in a lot of the other alternatives in this space. Um, specifically, uh, like JSON web tokens, um, they do use public key cryptography, which means that any application or user with the public key can validate a token offline. But unlike JSON web tokens, um, biscuits are capabilities based. So they can carry rights information instead of or in addition to like traditional identity metadata. And then like macaroons, I don't know if anyone knows what macaroons are. Um, they're probably the token that most inspired biscuits, but like macaroons, biscuits support offline attenuation, which means that any valid token can be used to issue a new, less capable valid token by attenuating its rights without communicating with the issuing party. Um, I think the uh, most different thing from macaroons is that biscuits use a standardized logic language for defining capabilities, and it's similar to Rego. Um, this highly capable data log based language can model almost any authorization paradigm with ease, uh, you know, role based, group based, attribute based, even policy based access control. And I think one of the coolest things about uh, biscuits logic language is it has uh, tools that allow you to evolve the underlying authorization model over time as your requirements inevitably change. And this is something that we've already taken advantage of a few times as we've matured our temporal practices and evolved our authorization strategies. And then last but not least, um, biscuits are actually pretty small. Um, they use a pretty clever combination of efficient serialization strategies like protocol buffers and symbol tables to remain incredibly compact on disk. I want to call out the, the second to last uh, comment about uh, you can evolve it without breaking your existing tokens, oh, which thank you. is like amazing. Okay, so how we use biscuits with Temporal at HashiCorp is uh, we have a tiny IAM service that allows administrators to define roles, which represent a collection of capabilities that are available to a principal or set of principals under a certain set of conditions. Our SDK then exchanges a user's identity token for a short-lived biscuit that contains the data log program compiled from the role definition, 
Then prior to executing a temporal command, the SDK uh, generates or issues a, a single-use child token from that short-lived biscuit, which it passes to the worker via context propagation. When the workflow is received by the worker, it's uh, inbound interceptors deserialize the biscuit, verify it using the token's public key, and then initialize an authorizer with a standard collection of authorization context. And then at that point, the workflow is free to inject any additional uh, authorization context that's relevant to the particular workflow or signal or update before evaluating the authorization decision. And the decision itself is side effect free, and it doesn't need to communicate with an uh, external party. And uh, I guess, yeah, one last cool thing is that because all of the relevant authorization details is included in this authorization virtual machine, any authorization failures are self-describing. And so it's really helpful in troubleshooting authorization logic in workflows. Um, so despite their somewhat intimidating first appearance, um, their unique combination of capabilities has been an incredibly powerful combination and a really great fit for our use case. So the, this is the, the fourth challenge we're going to talk about. With those first three challenges um, sort of out of the way, uh, we were able to kind of get pretty far along on our journey. And the farther along we got, the more we started to recognize obvious patterns. Uh, one of these patterns was that a lot of our workflows um, in the infrastructure domain uh, revolve around managing cloud infrastructure. And these workflows were often just calling a bunch of cloud provider APIs. And really, as experienced Terraform practitioners, we, we sort of recognized really we're starting to rewrite a lot of code that already exists in the vast ecosystem of Terraform providers. Similarly, many of the workflows themselves began to resemble the familiar create, read, update, delete pattern. Um, and we're starting to resemble cloud provider APIs themselves. So we saw an exciting opportunity uh, to simplify our workflows, to expose them to our consumers, um, and just by taking advantage of all the investment in Terraform that had been made within HashiCorp. In practice, Terraform has been a useful tool for both exposing consumer-facing workflows as well as simplifying the internal implementation of our, uh, of our own workflows, uh, which are managing cloud infrastructure. For the external interface, we leverage our code generation capabilities uh, to expose the temporal services workflows as Terraform resources managed through our own custom Terraform provider. And on the internal implementation side, we publish a reusable collection of temporal workflows and activities for executing Terraform using the Terraform Enterprise API and the thousands of open source providers that it supports. Taken together, this has made it incredibly easy for platform teams to offer managed infrastructure as a service using their own domain expertise and existing Terraform configurations without many of the shortcomings inherent to Terraform modules, such as requiring their consumers to track module versions or requiring their consumers to acquire uh, privileges for managing sensitive cloud infrastructure that maybe they shouldn't actually have access to manage. Um, and so this approach allows platform teams to focus on what they're good at, managing and evolving the underlying infrastructure uh, independent of downstream application deployment pipelines. It's just Terraform under the hood. I love that slide. I love Scooby-Doo too, so. Um, we're nearing the end of our talk, and so to wrap up, I'm gonna try to tie it all together by walking through a quick end-to-end -end journey of what a temporal service looks like today at HashiCorp. Uh, we'll start with a platform team implementing infrastructure workflows on day zero. Uh, we'll follow that with a end user of our platform consuming those workflows on day one, and then end with platform operators evolving those same in workflows on day two. So, um, Sorry, it didn't work. <laughs> so it begins with the platform team deciding to offer some managed infrastructure capability via one or more temporal workflows that they define using 
protobuf schemas along with temporal annotations provided by our Protoc plugin. Uh, in many cases, these workflows take the familiar form of create, read, update, delete operations around some managed infrastructure primitive. And even more often, the primitives themselves are configured via Terraform. And they might have some you know, auxiliary lifecycle automation workflows. So after defining their service schema, they implement the generated workflow and activity interfaces uh, produced by code generation. They're then able to leverage our reusable collection of Terraform workflows and activities for simplifying the integration between Temporal and Terraform before publishing their service with some help from our internal SDK. And once their service is deployed, they're able to expose their infrastructure resources, or infrastructure workflows, I should say, as one or more Terraform resources via our internal Terraform provider, via code generation. And then on day one, an end user of our platform chooses a managed uh, infrastructure resource as part of their services provisioning code. They're able to lean on our provider documentation to understand the supported configurations. And they're also able to get started easily by copying some of the code samples that we include in our uh, provider documentation. Um, at deployment time, our custom provider utilizes the services generated client um, to execute the corresponding lifecycle workflow. Uh, the client's outbound interceptor uh, validates the request and then generates a single use biscuit, which it passes to the uh, worker via workflow metadata. And the worker uses that to authorize the workflow. And then once authorized, the workflow executes the supporting you know, underlying Terraform code using our reusable Terraform, library, Terraform workflow libraries. And then on day two, um, a platform operator is asked to evolve the underlying infrastructure, um, which is inevitable, right? And they do that by adjusting the Terraform configuration or modifying the operational workflows. And by leaning on Temporal as an abstraction between consumer-facing and platform-owned Terraform, um, Temporal enables two distinct and independent software development life cycles for platform and product teams which allows platform teams to deliver high leverage force multiplying capabilities to the organization while freeing up product teams to focus on delivering value for our customers. And so if I could leave you with a handful of takeaways, um, I would encourage you to consider not hiding or wrapping the temporal SDKs, but maybe just extending them for your use case. I'd highly encourage the use of code generation. And if you're into uh, protobufs or Go, check out our ProTalk plugin. If you're going to you know, dive in the deep end and start using Temporal directly as your API, uh, check out Biscuits for securing your workflows. And last but not least, Terraform and Temporal are better together. Terraform is a great user interface mechanism for exposing self-service workflows and also a great implementation tool for uh, managing cloud infrastructure within Temporal. And that's our talk. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to all the Temporal folks for this great conference. Thanks. Questions? Chandler. Hi there. Um, I'm curious why y'all chose, uh, I know you mentioned like you were inspired by last uh, year's talk about using the temporal workflows and signals and stuff as APIs, but I wonder if you could just walk through like the pros and cons of why you actually made that decision versus like you know, putting a small uh, API in front of it or something like that? Sure. Um, I think for us, because we deal with predominantly infrastructure-focused workflows, a lot of these operations are very long-lived. Um, when we're working with you know, database clusters or search index clusters or things like that, and we found that if we were to wrap our temporal workflows behind uh, like a gRPC service, that we would end up having to reinvent you know, the polling mechanisms and all those other things that kind of go along with it that we just get out of the box for free with Temporal. But I will caveat that and say, we do have use cases where we expose some of these um, Temporal APIs kind of outside of our internal network. And in those cases, we do wrap uh, Temporal with gRPC or Connect. 
I'm trying to understand your philosophy about um, like extending and not hiding the SDK. So, like one example that I've seen you do is like manage the task queues for the users. Um, like we actually do the same thing at Instacart because in most cases like a workflow is kind of tied to a particular task queue. So would an example be like by default you send the workflow to that task queue, but like since you're not hiding the SDK, the user can just set their own task queue and like shoot themselves in the foot in the process? That's a good question. I think um, the approach we've taken is to bake as much into code generation as possible, and that is owned by the service provider. And so they're the ones that know kind of like what the your right values are for retry policies or um, ID formats and things like that. And code generation with a combination with our SDK takes kind of all of those questions that most people are confronted with when they're getting started with Temporal out of the picture. We do allow folks to override those things, but it's, it's more of like an escape hatch model. It's not something that we kind of push up front and make it you know, an obvious thing to do, if that makes sense. Thanks. I think another thing worth saying is just that uh, all the generated code is also able to be imported, so it's like, it's also kind of a mechanism for like sharing what would otherwise be kind of like a, you know, just a, a random string, like, oh yeah, I remember it's that thing, I didn't realize they like started doing some different versioning or something like it's 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 also a mechanism for kind of like making it making the process of sharing things across different workers more robust as well. I guess I'd add one more caveat that we have um, we have a very specific uh, convention for how we think about task queues and how we think about namespaces and how we think about clusters and things like that and so we try really hard to not leave that up for individual teams to make their own decisions, and we bake that into our code generation and SDK processes. All right, I think we have time for one last question in the back. Hi, thank you. I wanted to um, just cover the last portion again. Did uh, what I was seeing was the SDK was generating uh, a workflow specification that represented a cloud resource, and then at the end there was there a Terraform provider being generated? Yeah, so <laughs> it's kind of Terraform all the way down, right? Um, for us, uh, Terraform is definitely like the lingua franca of the organization, and so. Um, yeah, I guess to kind of summarize that, like what we found is that a lot of the infrastructure that we manage on behalf of product teams at HashiCorp, it's more than just like the getting started Terraform code you find in the public registry for you know things like Amazon RDS or, or stuff like that. A lot goes into making a cloud service production ready for us at, at HashiCorp. And we include you know, all of the Datadog uh, resources that, that we use to monitor it. We include vault integrations, console integrations, things like that. Retention and so, policies, deletion protection. Yeah, so um, instead of kind of, we, we have in the past used Terraform modules and to bundle all this stuff up, but what we found is that it creates a lot of uh, mental overhead. It requires teams to have access to a bunch of different systems that we don't necessarily have great tools for making very granular um, ACLs for. And so by, able, by being able to kind of package up our managed infrastructure as a managed Terraform resource and use Temporal as the mechanism to, to kind of uh, enforce that, we found it to be a really powerful pattern. Thanks. All right, how about a round of applause? Thanks, y'all. Thank you all.